Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you all. It really is a joy to be with God's people uh, after whatever week you've had. Uh, I, I have to admit, I had kind of a low week, a, uh, a week after a very busy week, uh, and it's a, it's a joy to be among God's people, uh, whatever week we've had, to come before the living God who reigns over all things. We're going to be looking at Psalm 93, and so I, I hope you've got it open, and it's part of a section of the Psalms, book four of the Psalms, 90 to 106 where we hear that the Lord still reigns. It's centered around a time in Israel's history where, where their nation had been overturned. It's a collection associated with the time of exile. And so they're psalms for a chaotic time. The world has been in chaos, hasn't it? The last few years, political chaos, economic chaos, all kinds of disturbances that may have been troubling us in various ways. And yet, I I find it interesting that often the things that really throw us, the things that really get us disturbed, are not necessarily the big headlines, but the very local things. It's seeing that you're, uh, you know, there's been vandalism in your local park. Some random act of destruction for absolutely no reason. Or, or the, the chaos of, of everyday life, like the chaos that we experienced in our family this morning of having our four-year-old wake up at 3 a.m., uh, which is why my wife is not here right now, uh, because she was the one who had to get up uh, instead of me. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, it, it's often these kinds of chaotic elements that can throw us the most. And that is why Psalm 93 is such a good antidote to our feeling of disorientation. Because Psalm 93 gives us a picture of the Lord's majestic reign over His creation. His reign even over the chaos of the world. And they're words that are designed to to lift us up above the the chaos, the raging of this world, to see God on, on His majestic throne, to see there is someone in charge. The Lord still reigns. And I want to show you three reasons this psalm gives. Three reasons not to freak out, not to panic, at the chaos of this world. Now, when I say this psalm gives us three reasons, we could think, I could be giving the impression that here's some logical argument, like the book of Romans. But that's not how the psalms work, are they? They're they're prayers, they're poetry, they contain images. And this psalm takes us on a journey. It takes us on on a pictorial journey, an emotional journey, to to show us what the Lord's reign is like. It's a short psalm, only 93 words in in the English, only 45 words in the original Hebrew. And so, you know, this could could be a short sermon, a short punchy sermon for a short punchy psalm. Uh, It begins with an image of the Lord's majesty in verse 1. His royal reign over the creation. It takes us on a journey. Because in verse 3 and 4, that reign of God is threatened. Because up come the raging waves of the sea, rising and rising, until we get a glimpse of the Lord again, reigning even over the chaos. And finally, we're brought down again. I think the, the way to think about Psalm 93 is think about a wave. Because the structure of the psalm is like a wave. It begins, and we ride up on the waves to get a glimpse of the Lord's glory. But then finally, we're brought down back to earth in the last verse. But at the end, our perspective has been changed by the the journey we've been on. And so, we don't want to move away from this, this dramatic emotional impact that the psalm has on us, 
by, as we dissect it and think about these main points. But we will see three things throughout this psalm. Firstly, we see that the Lord's reign is established over the earth. Secondly, we'll see it's unrivaled by the chaos. And thirdly, we'll see how we can experience that reign of the Lord in our lives. So firstly, the Lord's reign is established over creation. It is fixed and it guarantees the stability of the creation. Verse 1, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. It's a a refrain which is repeated throughout many of the Psalms in this section. The Lord reigns. The Lord is king. It's an announcement. The whole earth is called to pay attention. Here is your king. And we're given here a picture of royal majesty. The Lord is clothed with majesty. Well, what, what does that look like? What does majesty look like? It's, a, it's an evocative image, isn't it? He has wrapped himself with strength. Here is a picture of the king. But it's a picture of his relationship with the creation. The relationship between God and everything that is not God. God is eternal. And everything that isn't God owes its existence moment by moment to his sustaining power. See, there is nothing in this world that doesn't have a relationship with this God. All of us, all of creation, every particle within this universe has a relationship with this creator God. And it's a relationship which has been established by the act of God creating. You see there in verse 2, the world has been established, but above that, your throne is established from of old. The Lord's throne is established. God's throne is is really a metaphor for God's relationship with His creation. His throne has been established in the heavens. That is, His rule over the creation. And why is it that God reigns over all things? Because all things come from Him. Everything has been made through Him and for Him. The eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who exists from eternity reigns and controls and governs all things. See, why, why is the world stable? Why does, why does nature function in an orderly way? We take it for granted, don't we? We get up in the morning, we, we open the door, we hop in the car and drive off to work or go about our day, and we just assume we live in an orderly world. Natural laws, which work the same every day, gravity, the uh, strong and weak nuclear force, I don't even really know what they are, but you know, I can say them, I sound intelligent. Uh, the, the sun rises and, and sets, the seasons roll on. We just trust, don't we? We live in an orderly world. And really, modern science emerged out of this deep conviction that the world is governed by a God who rules the world according to natural law. Early modern scientists like Francis Bacon had this deep conviction. It's what drove their exploration of the world, trusting that when they explore the world, it will operate in an orderly way. But where do those laws come from? Why is it that we can, we can trust that the sun will rise and set? It's because there is a lawgiver. There is a king who rules over nature. The world is established, it shall never be moved. See, the stability of the world we live in is grounded in the eternal God, the unchanging God, the Almighty. But there are plenty of things that we experience that seem to threaten that rule. Plenty of things which may lead us to question, does God really reign? And in verse 3, we meet 
the sound of the chaos, the roaring of the sea. Verse 3, the floods have lifted up. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. See, could this be a rival to the power of the Lord, the King? We really do take the ocean for for granted, don't we? Uh, We're an island nation. We're relatively comfortable with the water. Most kids in New Zealand learn how to swim. And yet, it's not the case around the world. The, The ocean is a fearful thing. Uh, You'll know this if you've ever been in powerful surf. I remember an experience once in Bondi when we were living in Sydney and and just being turned upside down by the waves, not knowing which way was up. Have Have you had an experience like that with the sea? It is a powerful force. Or those those videos of deep sea fishing boats, where there there are these 20 meter waves facing an ocean trawler, and it makes you sick just watching the video, let alone being on this boat. So the ocean is a powerful force. And in many cultures, their terror of the sea wasn't just the physical waves, it included a spiritual dimension. The sea was a source of evil or chaos. In fact, we, we had a Ghanaian student staying with us once, and she said that in Ghana, many people avoid even looking at the ocean. Uh, it, it borders the sea in Africa, but some Ghanaians, many of them, even when you're walking by the sea, you'll avoid the sea, you'll even walk on the other side of trees so that you don't have to look at the ocean. Such is their fear of the, the sea. And this was true of ancient Israel, many ancient cultures. The sea was associated with dark spiritual forces. Why? Because the the watery chaos of the sea, it pictures so well the destructive forces of this world which oppose God. And here, the, the chaotic seas rise up. They're louder, they're more violent with each line. There's a, a rhythmic feel to the original Hebrew, which sometimes isn't captured in our English. But the seas raging, threatening to shake our trust in the reign of the Lord Almighty. But in verse 4, we're taken higher, mightier than the waves of the sea, higher than the oceans, than the most loud thunderous chaos we could imagine, higher than that, the Lord on high is mighty. See, here is the ground of our confidence, the great confidence of God's people. No earthly chaos can rival or challenge the Lord's heavenly reign. No earthly chaos is able to threaten the eternal reign of the great King. Nothing. What, what, are, what do these waves represent? Well, we've thought about the natural world, and even beyond that, the chaotic forces of evil. Psalm 98, just a few psalms before this psalm, speaks of, of, of the Lord. Lord, you... You rule the raging of the sea. You still the waters. You crushed Rahab, the sea creature, like a carcass and scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The Lord reigns even over the chaotic forces of nature. And when Jesus, you might remember, when Jesus calms the sea in the Gospels, it is a sign that reveals His power over nature, over creation and even over the the spiritual forces of evil. He is the Lord, and He is to be feared. And the disciples know it in that moment and bow before Him. And so the chaos of creation will not threaten the reign of the Lord Almighty. But perhaps in this image of the sea, we should also see the raging of the nations. The raging of the nations, Psalm 2, at the beginning of the book of Psalms. We hear of the nations. The nations rage against the the Lord 
and his anointed. The kings of the earth set themselves against God's reign, oppose him, and oppose his Messiah, his chosen king. See, God has a plan to create a people for himself, to carve out a space within his world where there are a people for his name who, who praise him, who recognize his majesty and welcome his rule. That is who Israel were to be in the land that God had chosen for them. And yet when God begins this plan, at that very moment, the nations are there, threatening to swallow up God's people, to wash them away, right throughout the Bible, and even today. Friends, even today, God's people face the same chaos, the nation's rage. September last year, in uh, Laos, uh, in a, a country in Southeast Asia, a Christian widow, her name Mei Aining, with her five children, who had come to trust in the Lord Jesus, a Christian family, the village authorities came to them and demanded that they renounce their faith in Christ. The widow and her children refused, and so on September the 23rd, villagers arrived to dismantle the family's barn, the place where they stored their crops and food. The next day, they came and dismantled the woman's house, beam by beam, drove her out of town and put her in police detention. See, the nation's rage. The seas have lifted up and the, their pounding waves are felt by God's people throughout this world today. But don't be deceived by the appearances. That's the, the message of the psalm, isn't it? Don't be deceived, because above all of this chaos, the Lord still reigns. He is on the throne, and this chaos will not have the last word. Listen to these words from C.H. Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, reflecting on this image in Psalm 93. He says this, For the ungodly are all foam and fury, noise and bluster, and during their little hour, the tide turns or the storm is hushed, and we hear no more of them while the kingdom of the eternal abides in the grandeur of its power. These threshing waves one day will be no more. They will be stilled by the great king. What a comfort for God's people living in persecution. No chaos of this world, not even when the nations rage, but we could also apply this image to, to the moral chaos of this world. The moral chaos, the, the way that humans rage against God's moral order. The Psalms often talk about human wickedness as shaking the foundations. And it's true, isn't it, that in this world, and maybe particularly in the West, around issues of marriage and sexuality the attempt to overturn norms, the attempt to rage against moral, God's moral order that He has set in place, to dismantle marriage and the family. And we can assume, or perhaps marriage is just a human custom, it's something that we invented, rather than part of the created order, something God has established. And sometimes Christians can forget that too and, and freak out a bit and look at the chaos of the world around them in society and, 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 and fear that perhaps humans have the ability to, to wash these things away. We can get a bit panicky, can't we? Psalm 93 says there's no need to panic. The Lord reigns. Marriage and, and the moral order, they are part of the world that God has established. The world is established, it shall never be moved. Christ Jesus points back to 
Genesis 1 and assures us that God founded marriage at the beginning. And so we don't need to fear that in the turmoil of this world, these things will somehow be erased. The Lord still reigns over heaven and earth. Christopher Ashe, in his book on marriage, says this, It is not as though the God-given institution of marriage were under ontological threat. It is not within the power of humankind, finally, to destroy created order. It was given to humankind in creation. It stands above human history and the human will. And finally, it will be restored and transformed in the new heavens and the new earth. No institution, he says, no institution that is part of the created order can be destroyed by human disobedience. And so do you trust that? <clears throat> Excuse me. That the Lord <clears throat> is on his throne. There is no need to panic. The chaos of this world, the chaos of the nations, the chaos of my voice, <clears throat> uh, the chaos against the moral order within society. But we could also apply this image, couldn't we, to our personal lives and the chaos we experience on a daily basis, the lack of control that we often face. It is deeply comforting to know that in the chaos of my life, the Lord still reigns over it all. There is no rival to the Lord's rule in this world and in my life. Some days it can feel like everything is out of control. You, you, you forget the appointment, the car won't start, uh, you yell at the kids, you, you realise you haven't eaten anything or drunken anything all day, and you, your head is in a spin. It can be very easy to believe that the chaos reigns, that everything is out of control. When you feel like you're behind on a million things, the tasks are, are all piling up, it just feels like a massive wave of chaos overwhelming you, doesn't it? Threatening to swallow you up. Well, hear this, that even in that chaos, the world is stable, the sun will rise tomorrow, and God is on His throne. And friends, He won't let go of you in the midst of that chaos. The Almighty One is infinitely more powerful than any chaos you can experience in your life. He thunders His voice and the earth melts. There is no need to fear anyone but Him. In all these things, Scripture gives us this wonderful picture of the Almighty and His reign over His world. His purposes for us are secure. And at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 19, we heard, there is one on the throne. The Almighty is on His throne, and He is working out His purposes. The nations may rage, the chaos in our lives may threaten to undo us, and yet He will achieve His purposes and He will achieve His purposes for you, His people. Revelation 19. Hallelujah. The crowds in Revelation cry out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready the people of God, that He has called to Himself. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, pure and bright. See, we're lifted up, aren't we, in this psalm? We're lifted up to, to 
gain a vision of God's majesty that is over the world. It's the same majesty we see throughout the book of Revelation. And as we come down off the other side of this this wave of Psalm 93, it gives us a new perspective on daily life, on everyday realities. Because how do we experience this reign of God? It is the everyday things of trusting God's Word and experiencing His presence in the place that He has chosen to dwell. And that's where verse 5 lands, if you look there in the final verse of this psalm. As we come down, we've been taken to the heights. God reigns over the chaos. But here in verse 5, the waves are stilled, and we come back down to our everyday lives and how the reign of this majestic God is established. Firstly, His decrees. Your decrees, verse 5, are very trustworthy. See, the, the, the Word of God, the Bible, is the, are the decrees of this King who reigns on high. And His Word can be trusted. It's an expression of His rule. And here is the test of whether you're willing to live under the reign of this King. Do you treasure God's words? Do you trust God's words? Do you live by these words? These words are trustworthy and true. Do you gather with God's people on Sunday and and throughout the week to remember, to trust, to hold on to the decrees of the Lord? But secondly, the holiness of God's house. Verse 5. Verse 5 says, holiness befits your house. It's a bit of an old word in the ESV, isn't it? Befits. Uh, it, it's a word which means it's, it is the beauty of it. It, it is the, the thing which adorns God's house. Holiness. Holiness is, a, is a, a, a Bible word. We don't often use it. But it's a word which is used to describe order. Perfection. The arrangement of things in conformity with God's character. Well, that's the opposite of chaos, isn't it? We're brought down from the the great rule of God through the chaos of this world to a place where God's order is seen. Things are arranged to, to line up with the way God wants them, His character. That's what holiness is all about. And for Christians today, it is not the physical temple where that is experienced, but rather the place where God's Word is proclaimed the spiritual house, the church, the dwelling place of God by His Spirit. And here is the amazing truth of the New Testament, that that the place where God chooses to dwell is here. Not here as in this this building. Most of the week it's uh, pretty dark and uninhabited. But here among God's people, very ordinary gathering in many ways. And yet, as we've seen the reign of the God who is king over the creation, we're encouraged here to to see that this is the place where this majestic God uniquely is present and dwells with His people in holiness. Isn't that a phenomenal thought? And he's arranged it in a particular way, given the church his word, the sacraments. He has called the church to to holy living, to love. And rather than conforming to the chaos of the world and being swept up in it, to be different. As the world rages against the church to live godly lives, to to have minds that are being renewed by God's Word, to live in the fear of the Lord and, and by the power of the Spirit that He has caused to dwell in us. See, Jesus, at the end of John's Gospel, prepares His disciples for the chaos as He sends them out. 
gathering them in the upper room. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. In other words, don't freak out. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. Trust also in God. He is preparing a place for them, he says. And he has overcome the world. And so, friends, there's no reason to fear when we see the chaos of this world, when we experience it in our lives. There's, there's no need to panic. There is a king on the throne. The reign of the Lord our God has been established. It will not be threatened by the chaos that you see around you. And so hold fast to his word and hold fast to his promise that he comes to dwell among his people by grace, making us his holy people. I'm going to finish by praying, and I'm going to use a a prayer that uh, Spurgeon, who I quoted earlier, uh, prayed in response to the psalm. So will you join me? Let's pray. O Thou who art so great and gracious a King, reign over us forever. We do not desire to question or restrain Thy power, because in Thy character we rejoice to see Thee exercise the rights of an absolute monarch. All power is in Thy hands, and we rejoice to have it so. Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, please still our hearts. Help us to experience a deep trust in your sovereign care for us. And Father, in all the raging of the enemy against your people and against us, Father, help us to place our trust in your sovereign, eternal purposes for us. Thank you, Father, that we have a King on the throne, the Lord Jesus, who has overcome the world. And Father, whatever this year may throw at us, help us to cling to your word, to love your people, to cherish the way you have chosen to dwell among us. Father, we pray, come Lord Jesus, display your reign over the whole world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, it was in that upper room that Jesus also gave to his disciples this supper, a foretaste of the kingdom, which he has established and will one day be revealed over the whole world. A kingdom of love, a kingdom where the king gives his life for his subjects. And that is what this meal represents for us. And so if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, whether Christ Sanctuary is your church home or you're visiting with us today, we would love to invite you to come and share with us this meal. But if you're not a believer, if you, if you don't trust in this King yet, please remain in your seat and think about what we've been hearing today from God's Word. Uh, But for all who trust in Christ and follow Him, He calls us to come to this table and eat and drink. Mark 14 tells us these words of institution. As they were eating, He took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body, the body of Christ, broken for you.